So good afternoon, everyone. This is Ellen Webb. Welcome. I am the Healthy Energy Sciences and Advocacy Manager with the Center for Environmental Health. On behalf of the Center for Environmental Health and our partner and co-sponsor on this series, Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project, we welcome you all to the first session in a three-part series where we'll be focusing on the social and mental health impacts of unconventional oil and gas extraction and development. In this series, we will be hearing varying perspectives from nine different panelists on what is being seen at the local community level from oil and gas extraction and development. We will be hearing from mental health and primary care clinicians, researchers, anthropologists, and sociologists as they all provide their unique perspectives and work on the issue of individual as well as collective stress, trauma, and the health effects of oil and gas development. For those of you unfamiliar with the Center for Environmental Health, we are a national organization with an 18-year track record of protecting children and families from harmful chemicals in our air, water, food, and hundreds of everyday products. One of the many things that we do is provide educational and resources and tools such as this webinar series to advocates and community members so that we can all work together to try to live in healthier environments. So welcome. So with that, I'll now go ahead and um, talk about our first session today, which is going to be an overview of community impacts. And today we're pleased to have Dr. Jeffrey Jaquet, who's going to be our first speaker for the first session. Dr. Jaquet has performed social and economic impact analyses of unconventional oil and gas development, sociological analysis of energy development in areas across the United States, and has worked with a number of universities and extension agencies. He is a principal investi investigator of new NSF-funded project entitled Fostering Cross-Disciplinary Research on Energy Development. He attained his PhD in natural resources from, Co from Cornell University in 2012. Dr. Jaquet is going to be providing an overview today of the range of impacts experienced by communities and individuals living near oil and gas extraction. Uh, he's going to talk about research that has demonstrated an array of possible benefits and stressors to community infrastructure as well as social and psychological well-being and residents. However, these stressors are experienced and perceived differently across varying types of populations, and he's going to talk about that. So welcome, Dr. Uh, Jaquet. Um, we're thrilled to have you here today, and I'm now going to turn this over to you so that we can begin. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduction, I guess 20 minutes ago now. Um, <laughs> glad that we could do this. Uh, so my name is Jeffrey Jaquette, uh, Assistant Professor in Sociology and Rural Studies at uh, South Dakota State University. I uh, was just asked to provide a very brief overview, and I guess it will be even briefer now, uh, of just sort of impacts to energy communities uh, that are experiencing development from oil and gas. And just going to give a really brief overview here. I uh, wanted to look at sort of two different types of uh, two different categories of impact, maybe more at the, at the community level, uh, which would be impacts such as population change, uh, many times population influx, uh, housing shortages, service demands when it comes to health care and also many other types of services, environmental problems, uh, boom and bust growth, and economic development. And then more at the, at the residential level, at the, at the level of individuals, you see economic impacts uh, to, to different individuals, um, stress, community conflict, and then perceived slash real health concerns. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on each of these. Um, and, you know, a lot of times that the impacts do lead to sort of impacts to the communities do lead to impacts to residents. I mean, some of these changes such as uh, population change, uh, cost of living, uh, changes in sort of the the level of demand for local services and the quality that those services can be provided uh, do lead to, to real impacts to residents. Uh, but it's also true that these are not necessarily equal. Lots of times impacts to communities don't necessarily lead to impacts to residents or, you know, the, the impacts to communities such as population, housing, service demands might actually be quite low. However, uh, you know, residents still perceive that there are uh, you know, big sort of 
big impacts accruing to them in their own lives. And then I think probably most accurately, you know, there's a feedback loop here in that uh, these more macro structural changes to, to communities and local economies can change how people uh, sort of perceive and the, you know, the amount of stress they have, uh, the impacts to their, to their sort of uh, personal and family economics can also, you know, feedback and, and create additional impacts to the community as a whole. Um, in terms of just the more macro level, the more structural changes, I think in a lot of communities where you see energy development, you see lots of population growth, uh, workforce related. Most of the workforces in the oil and gas industry are not local to any particular lo locale, or if they are local to locales, it's areas that have seen, you know, generations long uh, energy development, Oklahoma, Texas, Wyoming, uh, and so on, um, and that in for any particular place, it requires a, a, a large workforce to, to migrate in uh, to take these jobs, at least at the immediate term. Um, so you see lots of temporary workforces. You see some permanent workers and some families that come with. And um, you know, I, I said before that all it takes is a you know a small percentage of those workers to bring their families, and in a, in a small town, a small percentage will will equate to a large uh, number of new families in the community. And you see lots of additional jobs in secondary, secondary tertiary industries, whether it's you know service providers, uh, food service, hospitality, uh, so on and so forth. It can lead to housing shortages, um, you know, increased service demands for roads, for police, emergency response, mental, physical health service provision. And then, uh, you know, rapid unplanned development, um, that is n not necessarily viable or sustainable without the energy extraction. And, and see this oftentimes, I mean, I think this is a hallmark of natural resource development in general, is that there's a lot of volatility associated with natural resource development and it can really lead to overbuilding and building sort of permanent infrastructure uh, that's predicated on something that's very volatile and unpredictable. Um, so maybe an extreme example or one of the most I guess famous examples, you know, what's been happening in, in North Dakota where you see these huge sort of boomtown pressures with uh, huge population increase, uh, huge cost of living uh, increases, you know, the cost of living is similar to living in New York City, um, the sc school enrollments are off the charts and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, Williston, North Dakota, one of the fastest growing cities in the country for almost a decade. Um, and it has sort of lots of effects throughout the economy. I mean, one effect is that you can get a job uh, pretty much anywhere and the pay will be, uh, will be very good for that type of job. However, you sort of have to offset that with lots of cost of living issues and lots of, uh, you know, sort of stresses on local services, whether those services are restaurants or housing or, you know, court systems. Um, just some pictures from North Dakota. Uh, you know, hear lots of stories. Uh, you just drive through that, that region. You see lots of people living in trailers, or at least you used to up until the last year or so. Um, <clears throat> lots of, you know, workers that do, again, you know, a small percentage of these workers will bring their families and um, and, you know, these are sort of, I guess, living conditions that aren't ideal, uh, which provide challenges for people trying to provide, uh, you know, first service providers, also for people living there, uh, can definitely add a lot of stress, not only to the long-term residents, but to the workers themselves, which is, I know that we're going to see a presentation on um, sort of uh, the stresses of uh, workforce communities in, in Canada a little bit later in the series. Um, and, you know, North Dakota is a great example of sort of the boom and bust, the, the uh, maybe ill-conceived long-term development. I mean, to be, but to also sort of uh, stick up for these local communities, I mean, these communities are in a really hard place where you have such overwhelming demand for housing. You have people living in trailers with their families, so, I mean, how do you solve that problem? Uh, I mean, the probably the most immediate solution is to build housing, um, even if that housing isn't, you know, available for the long term or isn't viable for the long term. So, you know, you're really in, in a, between a rock and a hard place in terms of how do you solve these, these, these sort of boom pressures. 
Um, mobile homes are another example. Mobile homes, at least you can, they're a little bit easier to get rid of uh, if they're no longer needed. Uh, this is a picture in, uh, I think from late fall in, in North Dakota. Um, you know, there's, what's interesting is they're still building houses up there even though there's basically no demand whatsoever. And a lot of these houses are sort of in the pipeline. The contracts have been signed to build them, so they're still building houses even though there's um, an, an extreme oversupply right now in North Dakota. Uh, just looking at the, at the oil price that I'm sure everyone has been following. Um, however, the oil price will probably go back up uh, sometime in the next couple of years, let's say. And so there'll be presumably an increase back again of drilling in that area, although it's hard, if not impossible, to say. Um, however, you know, in the eastern U.S., uh, over the past decade or so in the Marcellus, uh, we've seen sort of challenges to this, uh, this sort of extreme boomtown scenario as seen in North Dakota. I mean, in the eastern U.S., in these towns, there's certainly been impact, there's certainly been population growth, there's certainly been these service demands. However, you know, the level of, of demand is not this totally overwhelming, crippling type of demand that you see in these more rural and isolated uh, western towns. Um, I think in the Marcellus, we've seen that development is largely regional and that there's lots of small or sort of medium-sized towns where growth can, can go if it needs a place to grow to. Uh, you know, growth can spill out to other towns within commuting distance. So, I mean, we've still seen impacts. You know, this is sort of the height of the boom in, in, uh, in 2008, 2009. Um, you know, some of these same issues with uh, crime, with, uh, with rent, with housing. Um, however, you know, I think it was not nearly the same level that you see in North Dakota and, or, or in Wyoming or even in, you know, the Eagleford region of Texas and so on. Um, you know, there's, in, in the Marcellus, there's been the emergence of these sort of hub cities, um, cities where a lot of the workforce concentrates um, and that they sort of work regionally out of, out of that hub city, which sort of lessens the, the stresses on these local and more um, rural and isolated places. Um, parts, suppliers, uh, workforces are more readily available. There's bigger population centers nearby. So these sort of effects have, um, I guess the, the eastern U.S. has sort of mediated some of these effects that you, the more extreme effects that you see in western U.S. Uh, just, you know, some of the hub cities, you know, just, uh, you know, Elmira, Williamsport, um, you know, the Washington area, south of Pittsburgh and so on, just as a couple examples. Um, and then also, you know, something that's definitely different is that you're seeing a lot of drilling in urban areas. Um, Pittsburgh, for one example, or at least in the sort of greater Pittsburgh area. Denver is another great example. Uh, we're seeing lots of drilling. And, you know, when it comes to these sort of impacts, I mean, the impacts to the communities, you know, this development is a blip on the radar screen when you're talking about the Denver metro area. You wouldn't even notice this drilling is happening if you weren't looking for it um, just because there's so much, you know, so much stuff going on besides drilling when it comes to you know, large metropolitan areas. Um, and in a lot of ways, you know, urban areas are sort of best suited to deal with some of these effects because they can absorb the workforce, they can absorb the, the, uh, the changes in service demands and so on. Um, however, lots of people in these urban areas, turns out, are, are quite resistant to the idea of drilling near them, um, especially in Denver. Uh, you're seeing a huge pushback from a lot of those residents for, for oil and gas development in the area. Uh, so just impacts to, to people at the, at the individual level. Uh, economic impacts can, can vary widely based on sort of your position in society. Um, do you work for the energy industry? Uh, do you own your home or rent your home? Are you on a fixed income? Or can your, is it easy for your income to, to rise and fall with, uh, you know, competing incomes in, in the local economy? Uh, do you own your mineral rights? Do you own a small business? Um, are you a school teacher? You know, all these sort of questions will really determine the level of economic impact that you see, whether it's a, whether the overall drilling is a cost or benefit to you. And uh, also seeing this sort of emerging phenomenon of stress, um, there's a lot of different stressors, uh, something that will be explored in detail in the coming sessions, uh, you know, change social relationships, uh, change community identity, uh, there's the risk of environmental contamination, of health problems, um, 
lots of community conflict, uh, sort of increasing vitriolic discourse, and then uh, the perceived, um, you know, and or real health concerns. Uh, you know, when it comes to health, there's such incredible uncertainty, there's an incredible lack of scientific data. Um, you know, perception really is reality, I think, when it comes to health problems just in the face of just the lack of good, you know, data on a lot of these issues. Um, so just you talk about social psychological or psychosocial disruption, just the fact that um, this development can really disrupt the, the social fabric of these communities. The community feels like a different place. It feels like a different place that you grew, than what you grew up in or the place that you moved to to escape, you know, the ills of, of wherever it is you came from. And that, you know, these changes can be traumatic to people, especially if they if they have a strong affinity or attachment to their community um, and, you know, just well, people derive their own personal identity it, to some degree from, you know, where they live and the place that they call home. And if that place changes, then uh, it can provide stress on uh, people's personal identities as well. Uh, there's uh, Michael Edelstein uh, looking at communities dealing with toxic waste exposure, called it a <coughs> Um, called it contaminated communities and that communities are no longer a psychological refuge, especially if they become stigmatized. Um, and really this has little or no relation to the actual level of contamination or the actual health impacts. It's just, again, this idea of perception is reality and that if people perceive an area to be contaminated or stigmatized, that's really all it takes. Um, one good example is the Three Mile Isle. Um, you know, disaster um, where you've had an estimated billions and billions of dollars of property damages to that region, even though there's been no health problems and it's mainly a, a matter of, of perception, um, but it really doesn't necessarily matter. Um, when, it, when you look at um, a lot of these communities, you see, you know, the effects of stigmatization. Um, I used to drive by this poster every day of for, for a couple week period in northern Pennsylvania. I mean, what are the psychological impacts of seeing this uh, on your daily commute um, in, in an area, even though your water might be perfectly fine, um, you know, that these can have real effects. Um, and there's contemporary examples all over the U.S. where we've seen um, communities that are stigmatized as being contaminated. Again, putting aside the issue of whether they actually are or not. Um, and you see fierce debate in many communities uh, um, where, you know, again, really vitriolic debate where, where this, is, this is not, a, you know, just a sort of a political, you know, argument um, necessarily as it is, a, you know, very emotional um, argument on, on sort of ways of life and, and sort of more almost philosophical issues. Um, and Freud... William Freudberg, the environmental sociologist, uh, coined this, this term corrosive communities to describe communities that are dealing with environmental problems uh, and sort of delve into these, these uh, vitriolic discourses and, um, you know, fierce community conflict uh, where you see these clear winners and losers and there's distrust over, over all parties, there's confusion, litigation, uh, bl blame over the faults and distaste over any benefits that accrue. Um, and Freudberg notes that, you know, in a lot of the cases, the community conflict is probably actually worse than whatever the environmental problem is. Uh, you know, the environmental, the community conflict can, can lead to hampered decision making, uh, you know, broken communication social structures, uh, less in community capacity, can lead to disinvestment, out migration, uh, maybe in more extreme cases. Uh, and it can also, you know, really the distribution of costs and benefits can really influence this and in that if people are perceiving there to be an in, a, um, unequal distribution of cost and benefit, that that can really drive uh, the distrust. It can really drive people's perceptions of impact, uh, their perceptions of risk and uh, how acceptable the development is and so on it can really be driven by uh, cost and benefit. Um, and so you see, at least in New York here, uh, this is a good example. So you have all these communities with bans or moratoria or prohibitions. You also see a, a bunch of communities that have sort of pro-drilling uh, legislation passed at the local level. Uh, a lot of these communities are sort of in the same county as the 
is the communities with, with the moratoria. Uh, you see fracking bans and moratorium um, in communities all over the country, even in communities that have that are in states with lots and lots of, of drilling, like, like Texas. Uh, this is just a just as an example, a survey that I've done in northern Pennsylvania, uh, looking at attitudes towards natural gas development and whether it's made the, the community better or worse off. And people with uh, no lease or no development on their land said it made the community much worse or worse off. And people who had lease and development on their land said it made it better or much better off. And so you can really see the polarization in people's attitudes towards uh, the development. And then I uh, just want to talk a little bit about that unequal cost and benefit. Um, you know, if you look at the available data on leasing and on drilling, it's really not uniform across, across the landscape. Um, you know, people who are landowners and who have signed leases with the company and have drilling on their property stand to, you know, benefit greatly. But if you're not one of those people, if you're not a landowner, or if you are a landowner but it's in the wrong location, um, then, you know, you, you don't necessarily stand to benefit uh, not nearly as much. Um, and if you look at these sort of these leasing areas in, in where drilling is occurring, you see this sort of tapestry of people who are benefiting directly and people who are not, uh, which can, I think, lead to a lot of this, uh, again, the distrust and the, and the corrosive communities. Um, so this is a, just a slice of a Google map that I like to show. This, I think this is in Susquehanna County in northern Pennsylvania, a uh, fairly typical scene where you have maybe a storage yard there. Um, looks like there might be a well or two on the property. Uh, you know, lots of uh, frack trucks and tanker trucks um, on location, perhaps being stored to go somewhere else eventually. Um, you also might notice that there's a pipeline um, there. And sort of, you know, who's benefiting from this development? Um, and what's not easily as, as noticed, I guess, is that there's, you know, 12 residences in this picture. Um, you know, how many of those 12 residences are receiving a royalty or a lease payment from this development? Um, you know, this, these types of residences, at least to me, look like they, um, you know, are probably very small acreages here. Um, there's a decent chance they might not own their, their mineral rights. And I think that the, you know, just the level of cost and, and benefit, I mean, they're all sort of uh, receiving similar costs having to do with the truck traffic and so on, but not necessarily the same amount of benefit. Um, so just sort of some general uh, implications for community health. Um, so you definitely have these more structural, more just physical challenges where you have, uh, in, in these communities, where you have strained healthcare services, uh, just really an issue of supply and demand from counseling to ambulances to, to clinic space and so on. Um, you also have increased traffic, increased accidents, just more industrial activity, more people on the roads, uh, just, you know, more people in general. Um, but the, and there's also, you know, possible revenues to improve this capacity. Uh, through, through a number of different, uh, I guess, avenues, uh, taxation from the uh, impact fees, from uh, you know, money from the from the companies and operators and so on. However, um, even if you even if those revenues do come to pass, it's really a difficult planning environment to 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 uh, figure out how to spend that money effectively. And then there's lots of stress effects uh, for both newcomers and old timers, um, disrupted social support networks. You see the isolation, um, sort of uh, stressful housing, uh, cost of living issues. Um, and there's lots of possible health and environmental problems. Um, so, and even regardless of, of those actual possible health and environmental problems, just the, the risk of them or the perception that they might be coming uh, can be, you know, proved to be a pretty powerful stressor. So I guess there's my uh, my very brief introduction or overview to energy communities, and I think I'll turn it over uh, to the next speaker. Great. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. That was great.
um, excellent presentation. And I urge uh, all participants, if you have any questions for Jeffrey, go ahead and type those into the GoToWebinar um, chat box at the bottom of the, of the panel there in the control panel, and we'll be, uh, we'll be doing some questions at the end. Um, so um, let's, uh, without further ado, I'm going to continue on to the next speaker because I know we, um, we're, we're already short on time here. So let's, let's continue to roll along. And, and I hope that those of you who are listening will continue to stay on to hear the, the next two speakers that we have. So our next speaker um, is uh, Simona Perry. Um, Simona is the founder and research director of Case Consulting Services. Um, as a professional environmental scientist and applied ethnographer, she works in rural and urban places across the United States to document and raise awareness of the interconnections between ecology, psychology, policy, culture, and history. Simona specializes in human ecological risk assessment, asset-based community development, local community-centric capacity building research, and transdisciplinary practices. Her current projects involve aspects of risk disaster preparedness and communications, psychosocial consequences of extractive industry developments, water rights, energy transitions, and the cultural and historical geography of waterways and coastal communities. She serves as Vice President of the Pipeline Safety Coalition uh, and is a member of the steering group of the Permanent People's Tribunal on the Human Rights Impacts of Fracking. And she also serves as a collaborator with the Livelihoods Knowledge Exchange Network. So today, Simona is going to be talking about changes to social and community norms. Dr. Perry will provide an overview of the place-based collaborative ethnography as an applied social science practice and the community health assessment tool for understanding the psychosocial impacts of unconventional oil and natural gas development. She will discuss preliminary findings from her ongoing ethnographic work in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, and its potential for illuminating normative change processes, perceptions of social cohesion, and intergenerational dimensions of stress and trauma. So thank you, Dr. Perry, for being with us here today, and I'm going to make you the presenter so you can begin. Thank you, Ellen. All right, everyone. All right. Um, thank you for uh, the invite to speak with everyone today. Um, so, and thank you, Jeffrey. Um, that was a really informative overview that you gave. We're going to take our lens a little bit closer in now to talk about um, individuals and families and neighborhoods. Um, so as an environmental scientist and ethnographer, my interests are primarily in understanding human environment relationships, the everyday lived experiences of people, particularly in places going through natural and anthropogenic environmental changes. And I'm interested in all this because I'd like to know what this can tell us about social and psychological change as it relates to places where people live, work, recreate, procreate, grow up, and that where they find solace. So 4th of July 2009, I began research in rural northeastern Pennsylvania along the Susquehanna River, which you see here. And I planned for this to be simply a continuation of ethnographic work. I had begun in Boston in 2005 where I was investigating the contemporary environmental conflicts in communities living along rivers in that city. And after scouting out the region, I decided to focus my attention on Bradford County, Pennsylvania. Um, this county is in the upper reaches of the Susquehanna River watershed. It's an agricultural landscape. And it also is the target for strong regulations or stronger regulations on farming practices that were related to cleaning up downstream Chesapeake Bay. Bradford County can be characterized as rural. It has an aging population. It's much poorer than some other parts of Pennsylvania. It's racially homogeneous, namely white. Um, it's also geographically isolated. There are no major highways that run through it. According to federal agricultural statistics, Bradford County in 2007 was still receiving most of its revenue from agriculture, namely dairy. In 2010, the county reported $150 million in cash receipts from this farming business alone. At the same time, manufacturing jobs were the greatest source of employment in the county um, between 2000 and 2008. And overall, local natural resources have played a large role in how people have made a living and continue to make a living in the county, whether it's by farming or in manufacturing related to the wood products industry. The county also, I found out, lies atop the Marcellus Shale Basin, which is a Devonian era geological deposit rich in natural gas. 
The first goal of the ethnographic work I set out to do in Bradford County was to systematically document how rural people and communities interpret their environment, the entire county, and their own lands with a focus on individual and community experiences of change starting in late 2009. This also happened to correspond with the very beginnings of the Marcellus Shale gas boom in the county. Now, what drives my work is not only this intellectual curiosity about understanding human culture and behavior, but perhaps even more, I'm interested in the emancipatory and empowering potential of simply asking individuals and groups who are rarely asked, in particular, what is your story and what is important to you? Now, the materials I'll be talking about today in this webinar refer to the social fabric of a community, which you saw in the in the outline about what this whole you know, webinar is about. And I have always found this an apt metaphor to describe how conducting ethnographic field work pays attention to the tiniest details of how that social fabric is knitted together. And then doing that, we can describe how the community looks to outsiders, but also reflect back those descriptions into the community. Um, and as an applied ethnographer, I also seek to understand how changes taking place may also be fraying or unraveling parts of the community in service to helping the community understand itself. So what does all that mean? Well, for those unfamiliar with qualitative social science, um, I just want to take a quick look at the eth ethnographer's toolbox and how I use ethnography in my work. So eth ethno ethnographic research methods seek to describe everyday lives and practices through cultural interpretation. The goal is to explain how these descriptions represent what are called webs of meaning, not unlike the social fabric metaphor. And we all live within these webs of meaning. So we want to capture and describe the meanings. And then we've developed these series methods uh, where we can study people's everyday lives, um, where they fit within systems and patterns such as different languages, artifacts, visual symbols, and on and on. And how human beings connect to one another, to their natural environment, to the built environment, to institutional structures, um, and other constructs of contemporary society. In contrast to other social science methods and approaches, ethnography takes what is known as an inductive and grounded perspective, which means that categories and meanings of analysis emerge from data collection rather than being imposed from existing models or hypotheses. So when this is done correctly, this grounded perspective ensures that data emerges um, and can be used to further research questions and hypotheses that have local relevance. And the objective of the study in Bradford County was to describe the cultural worldviews, personal and social interactions of rural landowners, specifically related to their land, water resources, and rapid industrial developments that were taking place. So the study utilized these different mixed methods, um, including GIS, focus groups, questionnaires, photo voice, oral history interviews, ethnographic interviews, participant observations, and archival document analysis. Now, just as important for understanding ethnography is to understand how this, all this data is interpreted. And what's important to know is it's an iterative process. So it involves coding interviews, observational notes, then re-entering the field and asking new questions where necessary to revi refine themes. Um, and this iterative process actually ensures that the ethnographic study remains grounded in local cultural context over time. Um, so this, I'll show you all of this through the work that I've been doing in Bradford County. So little did I know, as I said, when I first set foot in Bradford County, that I would be looking most closely at a place that over the next several years would be part of the shale gas boom sweeping the United States. And I was surprised that this simple question, such as what is important to you, would become really a therapeutic opening and even an empowering revelation for some of the people I spoke with, and even a catalyst for more community conversations. At this really critical time when the region was grappling with the migrant workforce needing places to live, uh, heavy equipment in large semi-trucks causing traffic jams in once sleepy towns, making rural country roadways unusable. And during a time when an agricultural landscape and the local rural economy was turned into an industrialized zone, which was being funded by international investors and outside developers. 
So a total of 31 landowners and 68 other residents of the county were interviewed between 2009 and 2011, and most spoke about experiencing what was later classified during data analysis as psychosocial stress. The majority of the stress was articulated by landowners or observed in the field as resulting from environmental and social changes taking place over a relatively short period of time. Now these psycho psychosocial stress factors can be analytically sorted into three themes with direct relevance to understanding the psychological and sociocultural determinants of community health outcomes and stress. First, anticipated or perceived changes to quality of life and loss of environmental resources and cultural amenities. The second theme was economic inequalities, and the third were acts of violence. So today I'll focus on the first and third of these possible determinants, although I have to note that economic inequalities could arguably be one of the most important determinants. I simply don't have time, definitely not today, to delve into this. So, um, Really, the, the thing I want to share with you today are some of the insights about how all of this can be used as a community health assessment tool for documenting environmental, sociocultural, and psychological change at the individual, household, and neighborhood level over time. Um, and I want to also um, add a little bit more to the work I've been doing about how this all can be used in forensic investigations of environmental injustices and human rights abuses, which is an increasingly important part of my work, because as evidence accumulates regarding violations of environmental rights and the right to information and participation of individuals and families living in the Marcellus Shale and other unconventional gas and oil deposits. Um, sadly, most of the information I'm gonna share with you was collected over five years ago. And there has been far too little attention paid to mitigating and further evaluating and stopping the sources of psychosocial stress in Bradford County and elsewhere. Um, not much I will tell you about today has changed in the lives of the people I've worked with and who remain living in Bradford County. And in some cases, these things have even gotten worse. So in Bradford County in 2009, the gas industry was welcomed by the majority of residents, a savior to the local economy, as well as a way to bring the U.S. troops home from the Middle East. Uh, most local residents, uh, particularly the native residents I spoke with, uh, felt confident that the state and public environmental agencies would not allow the gas developments if it was really as bad as environmentalists and tree huggers claimed. And what was also clear was that these developments um, were becoming the most frequent topic of public conversations across the county, and it was rapidly becoming the filter through which people perceived and judged the world around them, including one another. As one native landowner insisted on showing me around his land so I could see for myself what he described as the great American industry, he was telling me about how this industry will save our nation from foreign independence, foreign dependence on oil. And he took me on this windshield tour of gas drilling operations, and he was forceful in his belief that it was our patriotic duty to participate in the industry by supporting companies in their development of the Marcellus Shale. Now this duty resonates throughout most of Bradford County's native landowner population. It does not matter who you talk to, whether it's the gas company representatives who visit landowners, um, neighbors, family members, local and state politicians. This is used to justify leasing and pressure others to cooperate with the gas companies. This patriotism is rooted, deeply rooted, in the social history and dynamics of the county. For instance, the American Revolution was an important site in the county, and permanent settlers and the founders of the county are American revolutionary. Just, they, were just, they, were, they were ones who fought in the American Revolution. This patriotic value system and sense of duty and respect of authority and the, that goes with it has also made many landowners I interviewed believe they have no choice but to agree to allow gas companies to explore and develop their land and the rest of the county lest they be labeled un-American or unpatriotic. This is just one example of peer pressure among landowners that can make it socially unacceptable to not allow development on your land or to oppose the gas industry in other ways. Such peer pressure can pit neighbor against neighbor, creates an atmosphere of intimidation, fear, and mistrust, and threatens, importantly, social cohesion. Now, the rapid change in development patterns and social pressures 
the failure of companies, government, and elected officials to address local concerns and legitimate threats have led to breakdowns in social ties and feelings of mistrust and uncertainty that have forced people to question what they thought they knew about how their communities function and their governments operate and what the future will look like. As the following examples will show you, uh, these feelings are described as loss, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, stress, and general unease. And these had begun to consume people in their everyday lives in 2010. And by the summer, the broader social changes I was witnessing and psychological and social impacts were parallel to the individual traumas experienced by survivors of abusive relationship, relationships and other um, types of collective traumas. And not only that, the signs of change and stress were beginning to be inscribed on the outside and inside of local residents' bodies. As people began developing rashes, nosebleeds, shortness of breath, digestive problems, racing and fuzzy thinking, addictive behaviors, and other physical and mental health symptoms. One of the goals participants in focus groups uh, that I began holding in winter of 2010 identified was to document how their quality of life was changing as a result of the Marcellus Shale gas developments. To help me identify what quality of life meant to them, I asked each participant to take photographs of what was important to them right now about their lands, the county, anything that was important, and write it down why they took the particular picture. I then asked them to associate their photographs with maps of their properties, the county, and the gas developments. Out of this, they came up with overarching meanings of quality of life, clean water, fresh air, fertile soil, rural way of life, economic security, and family in the past, the present, and the future. The landowner who took this photograph in his region in the late 1700s wrote simply, roadway to my home, tranquil and deep-rooted. This is part of Bradford County, Pennsylvania. In a cultural sense, this roadway is part of a genealogical landscape where roads and hills are named after families who own the most land on that road or hill. Special places were denoted because they were where family memories and histories were made. And the entire landscape was identified by parcels of land, particular townships, or places where people had lived for generations, or particularly family had lived for generations. This genealogical landscape clearly equates a place with personal and family identities and vice versa. Now from a long-term community quality of life perspective, one of the questions this raised in terms of social change and individual and community impacts was how does rapid land use change impact the resiliency and health of a rural community? But most of us measure our quality of life not in generations, but in our daily routine. So what people noticed first was that this landowner's road and the thousands of other roadways in the county, which were the demarcators of family land and arteries of rural community life, were being destroyed and transformed almost overnight. A common theme in all interviews and conversations were concerns about increased traffic and road damages. In a pilot community psychology survey we conducted during the spring of 2011, the results we got showed that traffic issues and road damage were the two issues of greatest concern related to gas industry's presence in the county. This increased traffic and road damage not only resulted in people having to change their daily routines and dangerous travel conditions, as well it resulted in automobile, automobile fatalities. But there was also a noticeable increase in dust, diesel fumes, and noise. Air quality is certainly a public health issue. That is the topic of active investigation. Less investigated, perhaps, is noise. And we know that noise related to trucks and increased industrial activity was the most frequently identified concern of local Bradford County residents. This noise plays a role in stress levels, and it must be addressed if we're talking about quality of life in rural, unconventional oil and gas areas. The rapidly changing landscape and the changing relationships people began having with their lands, their families, and neighbors was one of the richest areas of discussion during focus groups and interviews. A more, as more and more of these stories and evidence of contaminated ponds and water wells and the appearance of water buffaloes grew in the county towards the middle and into uh, 2011, many, regardless of their opinions about whether the gas industry was good or bad, expressed a feeling that the gas industry's presence in the county had already begun to irreversibly change the connections they had with their histories of the land and their family, childhood memories, and their neighbors, both in the past and the present. The majority of agricultural landowners spoke about their feeling of sense of place as home being threatened by these changes. 
they said that, that's why we're feeling death feeling because change is coming in one of the interviews and focus groups I did. Um, and others talked about it like they were losing their love, the things that they love the most, they had taken for granted were going to be taken away. And that's what they tried to explain when they, when they shared their pictures. One case from Bradford County clearly illustrates how individuals can be psychologically impacted by the gas industry and how those impacts can ripple through an entire community, create social alienation and mistrust, and in addition, set the stage for larger social and political conflicts. This case involves township elected officials spreading rumors about resi residents, violating state meeting laws, publicly supporting the gas company regarding one of their very own community leaders, and it also looks at the deep formation of deep fractures in the township, with one side blaming the gas industry and township supervisors for threatening the community and ignoring landowner rights, and the other side blaming a landowner for threatening the gas industry and standing in the way of progress in township business. The landowner at the center of this case was a man in his late 60s. He held positions on the school board, is involved in the church, and his family has owned businesses and farmed in the township for five generations. He has signed leases and agreements with the gas companies. And when I first met him in 2010, he was supportive of the industry's presence in the county. In the spring of 2011, all that changed. Two separate chemical spills related to gas infrastructure occurred on this property. They were dismissed, the spills were, by the gas company as never happened. And DEP, while they were involved initially, did not follow through on doing soil testing to verify the extent of the spill or the constituents and the materials that were involved. But what frustrated him when I spoke with him about the spill even more was that he was accused of sabotaging the equipment by the gas companies. When I met with him in the late summer of 2011, he told me that the gas industry in Bradford County can be summed up in three Ds, deception, desecration, and denial. It was the denial part he explained that it caused him to vent his disappointment and dismay by painting this prayer sign that he put in the leased space in the town square. During an evening of despair and severe distress in June, he had sought relief by sitting next to the sign. Five state police cars were called to the scene. He was handcuffed, taken to the county mental hospital for evaluation and five days of inpatient care, and with no prior history of mental illness, was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and discharged with um, psychiatric medicine. In consulting with a clinical psychologist and the PA mental health consumer advocate, I was advised that such a diagnosis sounds impossible in such this short time frame with no prior history. Um, and I also, they, so they said they felt like his behavior, an unusual behavior previous to his arrest was not a psychotic episode, which is what they arrested him on, but rather a severe stress reaction. Nevertheless, the damage was done to this man's reputation and credibility, and he and some of his family were now distrustful of the gas industry. Following this, he was mailed a bill for township road work on the grounds that he threatened the workers when they were using his land as a staging area, thus preventing them from doing the work. In a township meeting after these events at which gas company representatives were present, a visibly shaken Bradford County native and retired veterinarian came forward to defend him. He said, we don't need to kowtow to this big business and let it run us out of the community that we've worked so long and hard to keep. And I just feel that there's been drastic injustice here for him to be charged for this road work. I think as a community, we need to work together. We don't need to lower our standards for these big businesses that want to come in and dominate things on us. I think they can do this business. They just need to do it right. And we need to work together as a community to make sure they do it right. This is not an isolated case. So in participant observations at community and landowner meetings, where all of the gas industry elected officials and different experts were also present, and during the majority of the ethnographic focus groups and interviews I conducted and continue to conduct in the county, it is striking to compare how cycles of abuse are evident throughout these field notes and interviews. In the early days of my field notes, I wrote, the tension surrounding the gas developments is talked about and felt everywhere you go. These feelings of tension, coupled with lack of communication or confusing information, and the fear on the part of local residents in general was evident. Then following environmental changes or specific events related to the gas industry, there was anger, blaming, and arguing by local residents and the gas industry, 
followed by verbal and emotional abuse, threats, and intimidation by the gas industry, local politicians, and vocal supporters of the industry. Then after it was revealed by the DEP or others that these changes or events might have a possible connection to the gas industry, there were apologies, excuses, blaming, denial, and the downplaying of the impacts of the events by the industry and its supporters, even the state government, including local newspapers and experts hired by the industry. This was then sometimes even followed by contributions of money to local hospitals, libraries, schools, emergency management services by the gas industry. Or more frequently, there were out-of-court settlements that included a non-disclosure agreement or a gag order. Thus, the event was forgotten until, that is, the next local resident started having unexplained gastrointestinal problems, another water well came up contaminated, a school bus was hit by a water truck, or there was an accident at a well pad or compressor station. Now, if the parallel with abuse and trauma is correct, psychologists, psychiatrists, and social health workers should be playing a very prominent role in evaluating and assisting rural communities where Marcella Shale gas development is taking place. There may be no smoking gun that fracking is the direct cause of water contamination, that gas companies have intentionally defrauded landowners or other such crimes, but there is a mounting body of evidence that abuse and psychological violence on a massive scale is occurring within Bradford County and other places where the gas industry has been and still operating. Until the perpetrators of this abuse are called out, these crimes there will be no, there will be no end to the cycle. Data from field work in current field work I've been doing, really had described these feelings of depression, the sense of loss, fear, betrayal, guilt, anger, the emotional highs and lows, um, they all parallel these victims of disasters and abusive relationships. But while these themes were emerging about the feelings related to stress and social disruption, I was also very aware that there was evidence that these stress reactions were not always specific to shale gas developments. Instead, there appeared in transcripts of interviews and meetings, references to previous conflicts and disagreements among residents or about events that occurred years ago that had either not ever been adequately resolved or had perhaps never been addressed. So to take a closer look at how environmental and social change has been imp impacting Bradford County over the longer term, in collaboration with local residents, I began a long-term ethnohistory project in 2013. This project with local landowner families will run at least through 2021 and will take a deeper look into the historic precursors to social cohesion and conflict in the community, meanings of quality of life and intergenerational dimensions of stress and trauma. And finally, I want to just make this plug for those on the call that are in medical and social service um, services to assist. Um, these are requests not only from my observations, but from the mouths of those still living in Bradford County daily. First, this community is in need of independent medical doctors and public health workers without conflict of interest, who have a very urgent and important role to play in responding to the body of evidence regarding health concerns related to shale gas developments. We need them to collect and analyze reliable health data and ensure that the results of environmental health studies are disseminated and transparent in culturally appropriate ways. Second, community researchers and other social workers and practitioners are needed in designing and helping local rural communities to identify their assets, build on existing strengths and unique capabilities, and develop strategies and tactics for protecting and strengthening rural livelihoods and quality of life, all in an effort to build and sustain communities from the inside out. These community-centric programs could go a long way towards combating abuse by the oil and gas industry, healing community fractures that have emerged as a result of rapid as well as long-term social changes, and hopefully prevent neglect or complicity by local officials and politicians. And finally, there is still great, perhaps even greater than ever need for a safety net of social services for those who are already experiencing the type of stress and violence we have documented in Bradford County. The reality is that social and environmental changes brought about by the shale gas and related to energy operations have already impacted many individuals, families, and communities, and probably will continue to at least for the next decade. The advice given by victim advocates and trauma counselors to those caught in the cycle of abuse is to cut off all ties to the abuser or abusive situation if possible. To make that escape possible and to take care of individuals and traumatized communities, 
a new breed of social worker and community advocate is stepping up. And I want to applaud Southwest Environmental Health Project for being one of those leaders in Pennsylvania. They, in similar ways to programs and resources that provide sanctuary for those suffering domestic abuse or fleeing disaster areas, provide a way for those harmed by gas developments to safely tell their stories and in the process begin to heal and rebuild their lives if necessary. We just need to continue to build and maintain such a community safety net for those who live in shale oil and gas fields across the United States. And I want to thank you all today for listening and I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it was great to hear about all the work that you're doing, Simona. And it's, as, as disheartening as it is to hear about how these communities are being impacted, it's it's wonderful to see that you're doing such important work. So keep doing that. And thank you. Um, so if people have questions for Simona, please um, go ahead and type those into the, the chat um, box and we'll answer those at the end of the session. So um, I'm now going to um, move on now to our third um, and final speaker. Um, so, and I urge um, any of you that please uh, please stay on if you if you can. Um, we apologize that things got um, delayed here. Um, so, our final speaker is Dr. Ruth McDermott Levy. Um, she is the associate professor and director for the Center for Global and Public Health at Villanova University College of Nursing. Dr. Ruth McDermott Levy's area is of nursing expertise is in public health nursing with a focus on global health and environmental health. Um, Dr. Levy is the co-chair of the Education Workgroup of the Alliance of Nurse Nursing for Healthy Environments um, and the founding member of Pennsylvania Health Professionals for a Livable Future. She is also a board member of Southwest Pennsylvania Environmental Health Project and a co-author of the American Health Associations of 2012 uh, House of Delegates Resolution, Nurses' Role in Recognizing, Educating, and Advocating for Healthy Energy Choices. Uh, which is called for, which has called for a national moratorium on new unconventional natural gas wells. Uh, Dr. Um, McDermott Levy has also taught nursing students um, and nurses about the health impacts of unconventional oil and natural gas development. Her current research is related to environmental health risk and community education needs in communities in Pennsylvania. Uh, so. Dr. McDermott Levy is going to be talking about health concerns from the community perspective, um, and she will be describing the findings of focus group interviews regarding health concerns of community members living in a county in northeastern Pennsylvania that is undergoing the industrialization of unconventional oil and natural gas development. Powerlessness and stress related to changes within the community were common themes of the participants, and physiological impacts related to long-term stress will also be discussed. Um, okay, so thank you, um, Ruth, for being here today. I'm now going to turn it over to you so you can begin. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey and Simona, for really <laughs> setting things up um, so I can go through some things quickly, and then I'll get into the findings and then where to go from here. But I think we, we are, we've been positioned really nicely um, in the order of things today. I... Um, <laughs> have been interested in um, unconventional natural gas development up in Northeast PA in particular for a while because um, I've done some work through um, other environmental health things and so of course that's when my phone rings. Okay, so I um, have, have been keeping an eye on what's going on and talking to a colleague here at Villanova, he was doing some um, stream testing and talking to community members and they all said, you know, you all come up here and you get information from us and you never come back and do anything about it. And I am um, genetically wired to be a public health nurse and that didn't sit well with me. So I wanted to, um, this is the first phase of a community-based participatory research study where I wanted to find out what community members' concerns were related to the environmental health impacts of unconventional natural gas development. And then also identify what were the best ways to disseminate accurate information related to what their concerns were. So I, I did want to come back and meet the community's needs. And so I ended up in Wyoming County, Pennsylvania. I did want to be in Susquehanna initially, and that was the original plan. Um, but because of a variety of things, I ended up in 
Wyoming County, which actually turned out to be a good thing. Um, Wyoming County, I, the study, I collected data from uh, July 2014 through May of 2015. So I saw the big the kind of the end of the boom into the bust for um, natural gas in Pennsylvania. But um, Wyoming County was really new to um, natural gas drilling, so I was seeing kind of everything unfold a lot like Simona described, but on a smaller scale. So um, initially when I started there were 131 wells in the northern aspect of the state, the northern um, northwest corner of the, excuse me, the county. And then by the end of um, my data collection, there were 228 wells. Um, but that wasn't the only thing that was going on in the county. Um, the county seat, which is Tonkanic, was slated to be a site for a silica transfer station, which are the frac sands. Um, and so the, the people living in the most populated town in the county were very concerned and, and actually um, started um, kind of unsuspecting activists started um, really speaking out and this is actually a storefront of one of the places that um, had signs all over in Tonkanic to keep away the, the silica transfer station. There was also pipelines throughout the county that continued to be um, installed um, kind of waiting for the, the next boom in natural gas when the prices do rise. And like um, Simona shared and, and also Jeffrey, uh, large fleets of trucks that certainly in the beginning of my research I saw and then they dwindled off. One of the participants in um, this study shared with me that uh, an average of 105 trucks went by her house 24 hours a day. So 105 every hour, 24 hours a day, which equals a little bit of math over 2,500 trucks a day you know, again, morning, nighttime, and she had not slept well in three years. So the stress really is true and, and is a big issue. Additionally, in the southern portion of the county, there was a dehydration station a couple years before I, I started um, doing the research, um, had had two events of large um, popping sounds that um, occurred during the nighttime and one was so loud it um, and and shook everyone that it um, the livestock you know went out of their their stables and they had to um, gather them and it actually was right around Thanksgiving so um, that still was an issue within the community and still a concern that people kind of they had a sense that that the the powers that be didn't really know what what they were doing with with all this development so um, like um, Brad, Bradford County and, and the surrounding counties, Wyoming County is a rural county. Um, it's a little wealthier, the um, median home income is $28,000. It also is very um, primarily Caucasian. Um, my, I surveyed a total of 27 people, it was a um, qualitative descriptive study, um, and I surveyed again 27 um, people in five different focus groups. And um, they were fairly educated. We had I had um, 17 that had bachelor's degrees or higher, and also with that education, they were um, a little more affluent than the rest of the county. Um, interestingly, I had six people that had signed a well. I thought that I was going to have to ask um, to have two different focus groups. And again, because this is CBPR, the the community really drives. Um, a lot of um, the research process and they insisted no I did not need to do that separately that um, it really wasn't an issue and, and actually everyone was, was very um, respectful of people's decisions. Um, there were um, some residents that lived within a mile or a mile or two and, and when we look at some of the data about um, health impacts and hospitalizations and, and birth outcomes, um, that's kind of the magic number of concern. So, you know, we did have some people that were close by. Again, I said it was a qualitative descriptive study and I'm not going to get into all the details of that. But um, the two themes that came out of, of the study were changing community and powerlessness. And these were related to um, environmental health concerns. And then I also asked um, how people get information and how they like information. I'll go over that. Um, I, I, this is um, kind of retrospectively after I analyzed the data, um, I 
defined what the change in community was and, and the powerlessness. Um, and, and the people describe their community as new people coming through the changes that are occurring, um, an industrialization of their community, changes in the rural life, and then different practices of newcomers. And again, Simona has um, uh, published that as well, as well as Lenny Rezik and, and her colleagues. Um, and then powerlessness was a feeling that, that they had no control over their personal lives and their situations and they couldn't make any changes. And that um, definition is from um, Thomas and Gonzalez and Preda's work with African American um, women, but also, again, Lenny Rezek and colleagues um, found that in their study with women in um, southwest Pennsylvania um, in um, natural gas development. So with the community members, um, as far as changing community, and again, this is kind of the macro level of the things that um, Jeffrey and um, Dr. Perry had mentioned, that they, they did talk about um, their, their, the legacy that they had in their community. And most people lived in the county either because they had a long legacy or because they selected the rural area um, to retire and a place to have a nice, quiet life. And so I will read some of the, the statements that people made. Um, this older woman said, this is my life, this is my home, these are my friends and my family and the people that I loved my life through and their parents and their parents' parents because a lot of us are third and fourth generation in this town so we're all connected. And they recognized the industrialization of their, their communities and how those changes occurred. And this woman said, I think the biggest thing is that they, they, the oil and gas industry, don't care about us as a community. It's just what they can get out of us. We're going to pay the cost and our children are going to pay the cost of it. And our grandchildren, they're the ones that are going to suffer for it. To see these people come in and give you hope of a future, it's like, okay, I can protect my kids for the future. I can give them something, not knowing they were going to take away their health, not knowing they were going to destroy the land. And this man um, is one of the people who moved to the county because he wanted um, peace and quiet. And he shared, there's no peace anymore. It's become quite stressful and that spills over into other aspects of your life. So it seems our lives are constantly in upheaval and disrupted by this constant construction. We bought a place in the country here so that it would be quiet. And the construction he was talking about were the pipelines. His um, driveway or the road leading to his driveway was ripped up three times in three weeks. They laid down different pipelines then they'd come and seal that over and then come back and rip another pipeline. So every day he left for work he never knew how he was going to get home. The changing community also influenced the environment and the people were very aware of the um, air quality issues. And this woman shared, yesterday it was horrific. The mountains are white, and I'd love to see them take those pictures for our brochure, come to the endless mountains, because they're not green anymore. They're pure white. They, I used to be able to see Elk Mountain from my window. Also, air quality issues within the home. A woman shared, this stuff builds up, and it gets in my house, and I get choked out of my sleep. At 4 a.m., I'm coughing. I don't have asthma. Yeah, I'm a smoker, but never, not like this stuff. It was to the point where my throat was burning and my eyes were tearing. Parents shared their concern about um, their exposures for their children. And this woman shared that her, um, the, uh, the pipelines that were at her child's school and the school relied on um, a well water. Um, she was concerned about the um, they were building pipelines, or putting me in pipelines during the school year, and she was concerned about her child's water. I also want to say these pictures are not the actual participants. These are just um, random pictures, um, so people's confidentiality is certainly maintained. But the, wo the woman said, I mean, that's my kids. They drink. They drink from that water. If they're thirsty, if they, they've already finished what they brought in their lunchbox, and they're drinking the water out of the fountains at school, I worry about that. As far as powerlessness, they felt as though the, the, the gas company, the um, agencies that were supposed to protect them, such as the DEP and the health department and the police, were not sharing information with them. And the woman said, they hold information so close to the chest. Everything's played so close to the chest. I don't 
I know there has to be progress. I'm not the person telling you we don't want or need it. We don't want it. But tell us what's going on. How do we protect our kids? How do we protect all of this? And this woman said, you, you saw them all coming in doing good things. And, and now we're like, whoa, maybe this isn't so good. I think now in hindsight, I can't believe that we had a congressman that was from our area that didn't alarm us or warn us or prepare us of what was coming our way because he was well aware of what was going on because of everything in Texas. And this father um, moved out to a rural community um, in the county um, and bought his dream house and found out that he wasn't able to manage that because of the cost of um, water testing. My wife and I, we sold our home because we did pay for the water test and it's incredibly expensive and I couldn't do it anymore because I knew the minute that it tested, if something changed, I'd have to test it again. It's incredibly expensive. So we sold it to get into town water and so someone else would bear the responsibility with municipal water and we literally moved from our beautiful location. There's nothing wrong with the town but we moved from the beautiful location specifically because we could not afford the water testing and they ended up moving um, into town and that's when the silica transfer station was planned on being sited in town and there was going to be silica, um, the station was going to be across the street from the school his son was going to go to. So again, um, trying to make a difference and feeling so powerless. And this um, mother shared her concerns about um, her daughter being exposed to things that she may not be aware of what was coming out of the ground and what the influence of that for her child. And so she said, I have kids and they're bringing things out of the ground that have never been out before. And, and they may not have a direct effect, effect now, but my daughter is go going to have some kind of reproductive cancer in 25 years because she's grown up with this in her air. And by the time she's grown up, and I don't want that to be something that affected her and I wasn't aware of it. And then finally for powerlessness, the woman um, who was a merchant shared the other thing that bothers me is these guys, they get off the rigs and they're coated from head to toe and they're on their lunch break and oh, you got to cash, they go to cash their check and they go, or they go into McDonald's with chemicals and they leave a happy trail of dust and whatever. All these people are getting exposed and why? Why aren't they washing it off? And as far as health information, most of the participants received or got information from websites and um, the gas industry, environmental health um, organizations, newspapers and television and radio. However, they didn't feel they could trust, um, they didn't really know where to trust and get the inform accurate information from because everyone had a different story. There were some people, because I had a very educated group, that did rely on the peer literature, um, peer reviewed literature for information. However, they shared that it was really hard to, for them to I, digest all that information. Um, and if you can imagine some of us who spend a lot of time in the peer-reviewed literature, sometimes it's overwhelming. And then you're not trained to do it or you're living in that environment. It has to be even more overwhelming. And then lastly, as far as information, some of the residents were getting um, information from trusted experts, such as their, their physician or their healthcare provider, or family members who may be nurses or engineers that could explain things or have background in chemistry. But they also were getting misinformation and or they were interpreting it as misinformation because I, I did have some um, nurses in the focus groups but they were not practicing and I did not talk to um, the healthcare provider. But an example of that is a woman who asked her physician about the silica um, transfer station and she shared that the physician said that it short term um, there's really no reason to be concerned and it, there may be a concern a generation from now but the most that you have to worry about is asthma and, and silica is a known human carcinogen and can cause some very serious um, chronic lung disease. So um, again this is you know kind of whisper down the lane but um, we're one thing then we know is that people are not interpreting or, or get or holding accurate information with them. And so we do need to think about how we can provide information and what the residents shared was um, that they would like to have um, information that 
is available by the internet um, from at a reputable site and they did recommend um, a place like the health department but they also wanted it to be downloadable because they were very concerned um, that people within their community who did not have access to um, the internet or know how to use a computer they wanted to be able to share that with them and I heard that repeatedly the concern for their other community rec um, uh, residents so um, you know they, there is a cohesiveness um, within this community within the communities in Wyoming County um, and so the recommendations from all this is to develop educational um, information related to air quality water quality um, and also um, they weren't the residents weren't doing the basic things like they were not aware they heard that radon was a problem in in um, natural gas communities but they didn't even know they should have been testing for that before so get some basic environmental health information and then as um, Dr. Perry shared the, the social changes and how we can work with communities to adapt with those social changes and manage um, those feelings of stress and powerlessness and and also if they need um, some professional interventions and so the second phase of this um, CBPR is to work with the communities this summer and also work with experts in um, oil and gas development and environmental health impacts to um, find information that is, that is accurate and um, is um, acceptable to the community members and then um, get that in, in a place that is accessible to everyone. So that's the, the next phase of um, again working with the community to meet that particular need. Um, also we need to get um, more health professionals at the policy table um, and I know that that has been brought up before but we really need to keep um, getting our, our voices heard and, and get involved in that and then um, also partnering with community advocates um, for, the, for um, enabling um, community members to be more um, engaged and, and advocate for themselves. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is um, for the, uh, I mentioned about the education piece for the next phase of the CBPR, but also thinking about chronic stress and, and that, that impact on um, communities. We talk about stress, but it also has physiological impacts of elevated cortisol level, elevated cytokines, and epigenic, epigenetic changes. And, and Three Mile Island, I know was mentioned, and there was no health impacts of Three Mile Island, but there really were elevated cortisol levels um, a year and a half out after the initial um, di disaster or the meltdown of the, um, the cooling tower. So we need to recognize the impacts of stress on communities and all of those that elevated um, cortisol level and cytokine and, and um, epigenetic changes have um, risks of chronic disease and that is a big problem in the entire country so um, we need to take that very seriously and, and figure out ways to um, help uh, reduce the risk of chronic stress. Um, this is just a um, thing of resources and I can take questions if you're available. Great. Thank you so much. That was really great. And I, I really especially like that you offered some you know, recommendations for what we can be doing, fellow advocates and others, um, to move forward with this. So thank you again. Uh, that was an excellent presentation and really you're doing really important work. So wonderful. Um, okay. Now, yes, please, for those of you that are still on, let's, let's stay on and get through some questions here. Um, we have some questions. Uh, the first question that came in here, um, and, I, and I believe this might be um, it may be for uh, Jeffrey or, or, or possibly Simona, um, but anyone, please, uh, any, any of you, please are welcome to answer it. The question is, has research been done in the United States connecting extraction-based development and increases in gender-based and sexual violence? Uh, this is Jeffrey. I'll take a stab at that one. Uh, yes, I... I am aware of research that has looked that has looked at um, people who are registered sex offenders and areas where there's lots of um, of uh, natural resource development, energy development going on, and have seen a a <clears throat> pretty fairly strong correlation there. Um, I think there there's also I guess 
less well-researched, more anecdotal evidence um, looking at human trafficking and places that are seeing intensive um, oil and gas development. I, I know that in, in North Dakota, for example, that, that human trafficking was sort of a major focus of law enforcement. Um, it, you know, it, part of the reason or part of the issue there is there's just way more people. Um, so trying to trying to pick out sort of cause and effect is, is a little bit difficult, whether it's particular to the energy industry or just the fact that you have, you know, 50,000 more people in, in North Dakota than you used to. Um, so I think there are a number of studies that have, have looked at that and have found um, s some relationships there. I think the the um, sex offender is um, data is just a little bit easier to, to reach a firm conclusion, though. Great, thank you. Um, and I, I have another question here for you, Jeffrey. There was a question about the comment of, around calling impacted communities corrosive. Um, can you can you go into that a little bit? What what were you, what you meant by that? Yeah, so that was uh, a term that uh, the environmental sociologist Bill Freudenberg uh, came up with, and he was just he was basically des describing communities uh, where there was just a large degree of con community conflict and people who uh, were sort of um, uh, I guess in disagreement with each other over. Um, sort of the causes of um, environmental problems. So if there's, um, you know, environmental contamination that people are blaming each other over who caused the contamination, who's at fault for the contamination, who's benefiting because of the contamination, um, and that the corrosiveness is, is the, you know, sort of is a description of sort of the discourse in the community or the, the relationships between between community members have be, you know become corrosive and you know, people have likened it to a community divorce. Um, you know I think there's unfortunately there's not a, a lot of great uh, longitudinal data on that in terms of communities that that go through these sort of traumatic um, uh, you know corrosive um, <clears throat> you know events that are full of, of community conflict in terms of what the long term um, what, what the long-term impacts are of that. Okay, great, thank you. All right, we have another question here um, for nurses. How can nurses get involved? Um, are there suggested organizations looking to employ nurses for this kind of work? Uh, I guess I will take that, Ellen. Okay, yes, go ahead. <laughs> As a nurse, yes. Um, there are a variety of ways that nurses can get involved. Um, the first one is there is a nursing organization called the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Um, and there is actually a subcommittee or a committee um, that is looking at the health impacts of fracking with um, the Alliance. And the, um, it's called ANI, the Alliance, when we kind of the acronym. Um, and then also through your state nurses association, you can get involved. Um, so they're the first places I would start. And if, if you have this going on within, you know, your state or, or region, um, you know, start with your nursing organizations, but also share with your policymakers your thoughts on this, because that, I think that's one of the big problems is not enough people are speaking up. Great. Thank you for that. Um, now we have another question here for Simona. Simona, the question is, can you talk a little bit more, maybe briefly, um, about some of the community participatory research methods um, that you use in your research? Maybe more specifically, are there particular methods that you think are really important to be able to gather and collect community perspectives and data? Yes, I can, definitely. Um, thanks for the question. and I. My own work, I think one of the most valuable in this type of um, uh, what's going on in some of these communities to me has been the group work, as I think Ruth can attest to. Um, I, I felt that doing, now it's important to do both. I mean, I think the interview data is really important. And interview data, not only in collecting interviews, not only from individuals, but from others in the same family. Um, which is something we're doing in this new project, um, the, the longer term study, is trying to get interviews with folks in the same family in different, you know, from different generations. 
um, I think that's also really useful because in the first pilot study we did it was just you know kind of the I think the age was like the late 40s to mid 40s to to 70 year olds so that's a particular type of um, of you know data you're going to get from that uh, age group. So it's important to get all kinds of ages and interviewed. Um, I also, I just really think, and I'm an ethnographer, so maybe I have a bias towards this, but more participant observation using the lens of an ethnographer at public meetings, um, local meetings, um, and any kind of event that is centered around the discussions regarding um, the community's decisions or ability to make decisions about oil and gas activities um, taking place. And um, I just think it's important to go to those meetings and, and to have some good data um, from people who are trained to, and skilled at listening and, and looking for things related to community change, um, the corrosive community aspects that, that Jeffrey's talked about. Um, I think we just need more data from a, you know, kind of a third, you know, professional observers, so to speak, or witnesses. Um, so the interview data, particularly in focus groups, where you can get community dialogue going, as well as observational data. Um, you know, there's a lot of archival information out there as well that we're going to be looking at with the historical um, project we're doing. So that'll be interesting. But those are some of the main ones. Great, thank you. We have another question here. This is, I think, for really all of you. Um, someone says, I live in Kentucky, and many of us are very concerned that deep well fracking will be approved in this state. Any suggestions to convince the energy decision makers that there can be psychosocial and health problems as well as damage to the environment? <laughs> oh. I could take that on if you'd like, this is Simona. Um, so when I was uh, first starting the work in Bradford County, we were actually asked to go down to North Carolina, myself and a couple of folks I was working with, to talk to the community about what was going on in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania. And um, it was interesting because not only did the, I'm glad, this is a great question. So first of all, I also want to say that. Because the people in North Carolina believed that what they were going to experience was going to be somehow different than what was being experienced in Pennsylvania. Well, it's never different. It's pretty much the same wherever you go. Um, and I think it is really important to ask communities that have been impacted what, what you can do if this hasn't happened yet in your community. To me, I think one of the things that we recommended is that um, really early on you try and educate landowners, um, and I don't know what the land ownership regime is in Kentucky in this area, but that you educate loan owners about how um, this will affect them financially, um, not always, it's not always a benefit necessarily, um, and how um, they, what they should do to monitor for impacts early on before things happen. What, you know, what water monitoring, air monitoring, um, what have you, health monitoring. Um, but you should also try and get folks down there who can speak to the large, you know, kind of social impacts that might occur on um, people like Jeffrey and, and others um, who can talk to the larger community impacts. And I think if you can get those folks talking to politicians and, and decision makers, um, they might be a little um, more aware and educated about, um, you know, how their community will be impacted. Um, Stopping it is, is something else entirely, but I think early on monitoring is really important. Having baseline data in communities is really key. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions here. Um, one is uh, concerning, Jeffrey, your, your project, the NSF-funded project, Fostering Cross-Disciplinary Research and Energy Development. Um, someone would like to know when they can expect to see results from that or, or, or see the publication coming out of that? Sure, I'd, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about that. So this is actually, the, so it's a project to link research um, on social science research on energy development. And so uh, it was a grant funded by the National Science Foundation to do that. And we're not actually producing any data. Um, 
what we are doing is linking researchers and link, providing a forum for people to to um, <clears throat> share their research and for people to, to discover social science research on energy development. Uh, so we have a, a website, uh, it's called energyimpacts.org. Um, and so you can go there, it's more of a placeholder uh, website at the moment. Uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks we're going to be launching a researcher directory uh, which will allow people, researchers, people who are doing social science research and energy, uh, including public health, to sort of uh, create a, a mini profile um, and then people will be able to search, uh, basically search social science research on energy based on geography, based on the type of energy development, on the academic um, discipline, on keywords and so on. And so we have a website, um, I guess design company who is, who is um, building that for us and hopefully it'll be done in the next couple of weeks. It's a little bit behind schedule, um, but we'll be coming together. And then a couple of other projects related to that um, besides the researcher directory. Uh, we're going to be doing a series of webinars, um, including one in the next couple of months. Uh, sort of just providing linkages between different types of social science research on energy and then we're going to be doing a uh, putting together a, a conference on uh, research related to social, social science research on energy in the summer of 2017 and we're finalizing the location for that and the dates for that uh, will hopefully be finalized this spring it's still a ways off but it's going to be coming up and out of that uh, conference there's we plan to have a special issue or two uh, related to sort of bridging these disciplinary divides, bridging social science divides across different types of energy development. And so I guess those are the, the main um, I guess the main products of this uh, research collaboration uh, network um, and you can go to um, in the meantime, you can go to energyimpacts.org and put in your email address and we will send you more information when our researcher directory gets unveiled uh, sometime soon. Great. Sounds good. Um, if anyone has any questions about uh, the information that Jeffrey provided, uh, just reach out to, to, to me and I'll, I'll make sure to get that information to you. Um, all right. So we have one kind of last kind of big question and then there's a couple comments um, here. The, the big question, which is for all of you, is um, how do we move these very significant issues of your work and others out of the esoteric realm to social media and practical applications? How can we make this all real to 7 billion people in the world? It's a big question oh, there. Oh, I love that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, can I, I'll start, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, as, as, a, as an educator, I, this is, I kind of beat my students over the head with, I think part of it is the academics and, the, and then also, I guess, the healthcare providers. We need to start using language people understand. Um, and so I blame some of it on us. Um, but then we ne then need to get it into popular media too, not just the peer reviewed literature, get it out there, um, you know, in places where, you know, people where people are reading and, and like you said, um, social media too. But we need to use language people understand. We need to start with us. Ah. I'll Wait. go next. If okay, you know. go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think that this is Simona and I think um, I just, I got, I got to make a plug for the Permanent People's Tribunal on the Human Rights Impacts of Fracking um, because I think that this is a sea change. To me, all of this is about well, for, when you start looking at the health implications, um, a lot of the water quality issues as well, and, and the fact that people say we don't have enough data to prove this or show that. And as, you know, as we pointed out, I think all of us, there's a perception issue that it doesn't, there might not be enough data, but people are stressed out. People are worried. Depression can lead to cardiac issues, um, annoyance and, and, and and intolerance among communities can lead, lead to aggression um, and violence. So these are at the heart moral, moral issues. And I believe that we need to take, make this the conversation. Um, I think continuing to talk about, and I think it was important for us to continue as academics and as scholars to continue talking about things we talk about amongst ourselves. But when we talk about these issues in the public, 
when we get out to news media, I think we really need to turn this into a moral um, issue at heart. Um, and I think that might actually reach more people and, and start motivating folks to act. Great. All right, so there's a few last things here. Um, one, I apologize, there's a question that's come in here twice actually for you, Simona, so I wanna make sure that you have a chance to at least address it in part. Um, someone says, wow, very powerful work you're doing here, Simona. How do you see it tying in with the human rights tribunal work you're doing? Right, well, the human rights um, work actually is all about stories. Um, and as an ethnographer, I collect stories. Um, Human rights, um, actually, you know, we have a lot of lawsuits going on. People, that, you know, are, are filing lawsuits against um, companies, um, gas companies, um, regarding water, but also regarding economic injustices related to royalty payments and that kind of thing. Um, those court lawsuits are a lot about, you know, taking place in the civil, um, civil actions in, in our local courts or national courts. Um, the thing with human rights... Um, is that this kind of turns it on its head. It's actually, if you if you if you look at human rights, we actually, um, you know, the, the the legal practitioners, which I'm not one of, they talk about human rights as um, as something that everyone has, and therefore a person's story about being harmed, that is evidence enough. Um, and the person who is doing the harm is the one who has to show that they're not doing it, which is not how we approach these issues in our court of law. Um, we think about it as the person who has been harmed has to show that they've been harmed. Well, the stories that we collect as ethnographers um, provide some of the stories of harm that, and also public health folks collect, um, provide some of those stories that are important to showing that human rights abuses are taking place. Um, and I believe that we have enough evidence to show that um, in many cases. So we're working on putting those cases together and the Permanent People's Tribunal will take place um, sometime in 2017 in the spring. Um, it's going to actually be judicial hearings here in the United States as well as in the UK where these cases um, collected by experts, collected by ethnographers, collected by communities themselves um, will be heard. Um, in, in front of an international um, panel of human rights judges. Hello? Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, oh, great. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure that I was not on mute. Um, great. Thank you for that. Okay, so now I'm going to, we're going to end this. I know a few more questions have come in. And so I just want to um, uh, let, you know, participants know that we will, we'll make sure that those questions are answered. But since it's five past, we probably should just go ahead and wrap up. But I did want to close um, with a couple of things. Um, one, which is that someone commented on that it seems that government is absent from the table um, and that, you know, they really, we, they feel that there really needs to be a role that that government can be playing, um, you know, whether as a mediator or an arbitrator or, ad, or an advocate, advocator. Um, and so I think that that's an, that's an important point. Um, that government should be more involved in this conversation. Um, and then finally, um, we have a we have a comment here from a speaker and a, a participant in, in uh, Australia. Um, she says, "Thank you to all the speakers." Um, she said, "It's worth getting up at 4:30 a.m. in Australia for <laughs> for this." So, in regards <laughs> to everyone, so um, just wanted to give a shout out to that um, to that participant. And said, "Thank you for for joining us." Um, so, I'm now gonna we're now gonna wrap up um, and. I want to once again really, you know, thank all the, the speakers for participating um, in today's session. Um, it was really great to, to hear all, the, you know, the work that you're doing, really important work. And just remember to register. That session will be next week, Monday, March 7th. It'll be at the same time. Uh, that will be from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, and for this, last, for this next session, we'll be hearing about social and community effects from the perspective of the clinician. So we'll be hearing about what clinicians have been seeing in patients in local impacted areas and what is being done to address these impacts. And please um, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any additional questions. And we look forward to seeing you all next week. Okay, thank you. Take care. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you.